There's one thing you can do that will simultaneously improve your cognitive function, help you build more muscle and burn more body fat. Actually even helps you with better sleep. You ready? Improve your gut health. Having a healthy gut makes you think better, improves your mood, enhances your ability to build muscle, burn body fat, even improves your sleep. This is something oftentimes people negate. Gut health is tied to all those things. Do you think the awareness on this is, is growing or is it kind of plateaued? I feel like two, three years ago when we first started talking about it, it was exploding. Uh, and I don't know if it's just me being in our, our bubble. And of course we still hear it, but do you think like awareness to the, to everybody else is still, I think people still, are still oblivious. Yeah. I think it's, it's growing in our space. I remember, remember when we first started the podcast and we talked yeah. about gut health. Nobody was talking about it. And all the, you know, the muscle heads and athlete, you know, athletes and whatever. It was like, didn't, didn't make, yeah. didn't make a difference. Who right. cares? Right. But now we have lots of data to show just how important it is. I mean, they discovered that the there's a gut brain axis. So it's almost like a highway between the, the brain and the gut. We know that the gut produces a significant percentage of the neurotransmitters um, that make us feel good, like serotonin, for example. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's the second most highest concentration of serotonin receptors is in the gut, first being in the brain. Um, we show that it, it regulates things like inflammation, obviously nutrient absorption, recovery, hormones, you'll have an effect on hormones. Mm -hmm. So if you're like into building muscle, burning body fat, you want to feel good, you can't ignore your gut health. That's It's literally how um, the outside world gets into your body yeah. and how your body reacts to the outside world. And if it's not healthy, what you end up with is this low level immune response, um, this kind of autoimmune like state where you're slightly inflamed Mm -hmm. Your body's a little bit under stress and it just doesn't adapt to exercise. It doesn't adapt to diets um, uh, as, as it normally would um, and oftentimes causes things like cravings and bad mood. They even show bad moods related to this pretty, pretty well. Yeah, it's weird. It's one of those uh, factors that, um, you know, as, as I'm trying to troubleshoot as a trainer with one of my clients, um, why they're not getting any progress. Um, we didn't even look at gut health and didn't no. even look at some of these things that were just, you know, plaguing, um, you know, her internally. And, you know, once we started addressing that, it's, it was crazy. The response that she got after that in terms of like, all of a sudden now, uh, it's like her, her body now allowed her, uh, to lose body fat, allowed her to build muscle. Yes. And, you know, that was like a key component that was holding her back, uh, which I still think a lot of people don't realize like how, much impact that has on all the rest of the goals. I, I wish we had research to like put a number to it. Like, I think if we had the ability to tell clients like, you know, you will build 20% oh, yeah, more yeah, muscle yeah. if we solve this first, or you'll lose fat, you know, five times faster if we could solve that. I think that it, people have heard about it, but I still don't think they're aware of how much it, it can impact their goal. Or even if they're, if they have a problem, like how many times I was just having this conversation actually with my mom who, uh, you know, her, her husband is dealing with a lot of autoimmune issues. And I was explaining to her how important, like that she's paying attention to all the different stress that he has in his life. And because that's directly in impacting that. Cause she's like, well, he's going to the gym. He's with, mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but how does he even approach his workout? Cause he's got the old school mentality of yeah, like beat myself crush, up. crush yeah. it. Like he was the last time we had talked, he was telling me, Oh yeah, no, I don't leave the gym until I'm drenched in sweat and this and that. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much the opposite of probably what you want to be doing because you've got all this other stuff, all this other stress, this autoimmune issue going on. And until you solve that, you're not doing yourself any favors by going to the gym and crushing it even more. So I think there's, even though there's somewhat awareness around it, I don't think people realize how much it impacts their their goal, their weight loss goals or their muscle uh, building goals. Listen, I'll tell you personally, this is my own personal experience because if you've listened to the show uh, for a little while, you know that I've had um, up and down battles with gut health. And more recently, I've really been able to, to, to solve some of the issues that have plagued me for so long. But there's moments where it's better, moments when it's worse. Now, uh, now it's much, much better. If you want numbers for me specifically, the difference between my gut being great and my gut kind of being off a little bit is about eight to 10 pounds of lean body mass and about one to one and a half percent body fat. Okay. Nothing else changed. Just my gut health. That's a huge difference. Now, it, it, and everything's controlled. I still work out. I still monitor my sleep. I take the same supplements. The difference is my gut health. Yeah. But yeah, this is definitely something that people are aware of now more so, but I think the mainstream still has no idea. I think they think, you know, good gut health 
uh, means that they don't get like crazy bloat or digestive issues. Right. But they could be much more subtle things that are going on. I, I mean, 20 years ago, I had a young lady that worked in one of my studios that was super ahead of the curve with this kind of stuff. And she would talk about leaky gut syndrome. Now, at that time, I also had a lot of doctors in my studio who were training with trainers, myself included. And I remember they would scoff when they would hear overhear her conversations. Oh. Talk about leaking, they'd go, oh my God, leaky gut. That's so dumb. That doesn't even make any sense. That doesn't exist. Well, now we call it intestinal wall hyperpermeability, which is just leaky gut syndrome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they know now, oh, this is actually a real thing. We even have studies that show that uh, people could take certain beneficial bacteria, uh, lactobacillus and the bifido type bacteria, and it reduces anxiety, reduces depression. Yeah. Wild. So yeah. they'll give people a probiotic and they'll have um, measurable improvements in their mood just from those types of things. What well, was what was it in the uh, Organifi's Pure product that is supposed to be good for? I remember we've been talking to Drew Canoy, good friend, yeah. also a partner of oh, ours. Yeah. And he was ma mentioning that, you know, Pure isn't just like a cognitive thing, that it also it improves gut health because of something that's in it. I had no idea. I don't think yeah. we, I don't recall ever talking and promoting it based off of gut health it's always been something we promote for like being sharper on the podcast i like the way that makes me yeah, feel energy wise benefits so too. yeah they're always ahead they're, they do they do such a good job because pure came out what four years ago maybe yeah and they have things that are that have been shown to improve cognitive function like lion's mane for example everybody's heard of that mushroom but then they have things in there like prebiotics that feed healthy bacteria um, and they also have digestive enzymes, which if you take a digestive enzyme, certain ones on an empty stomach, those reduce inflammation. You take them with food, they help break down food. So this was the first time I'd seen a quote unquote cognitive enhancing supplement with compounds for gut health as well. Right. Because they understand that that is important for gut health. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, kudos to them. They were the first ones to do it. Now you're starting to see other companies do the same thing. But so pure, when you take pure, there's no stimulants. You just take it and you start to kind of feel better yeah. um, and you start to feel sharper. Well, there's but definitely a crossover there with gut health yeah. and cognitive ability. You know, like for me, even going through what I've, I've had to battle with, with gut health, like it's, it definitely affects my sleep, which is a huge uh, factor with that. And then like, you know, the, uh, you know, how that affects me the next day and the brain fog. And then, um, also to the recovery element of that is, you know, that's always something I'm kind of battling and struggling if I, if my gut is off. Well, I remember, so, uh, years ago when we first started trying, um, or experiment, experimenting with CGMs. So for people that know, these are called continual glucose monitors. You put them on your arm and it measures your blood sugar in real time. Mm -hmm. Now you would expect with something like that, that everybody's going to respond to high glycemic index carbs or sugars predictably, right? Faster spike in sugar and a drop. And if you eat something without any sugar, say something with fat and protein or fiber, that you're not going to have much of a spike. But then you get these random people that would eat like an avocado and they'd have this spike in blood sugar. And they was like, what is going on? And they're mm -hmm. like, oh, no wonder I feel... We, when I eat this food that's supposed to be healthy, I feel like not so good. I'll get anxious with the spike and then I'll get kind of lethargic with the drop. What's going on? That's the result of leaky gut syndrome or intestinal wall hyperpermeability. What happened with this person, because their gut was inflamed, when your gut is inflamed, it's like your skin. If your skin is inflamed and red, then it's not going to be as good of a barrier to the outside world. Dirt and bacteria can infect you through your skin because when it's inflamed, the cells create spaces in between them, almost like cracks and things get through. This is happen what happens with the gut. So this person ate avocados with an inflamed gut for whatever reason, the, the avocado bits or whatever mm -hmm. went through their gut when it's not supposed to. The body is like, what is this foreign invader? React Let's develop yeah. an immune response to it. So what they got when they ate the avocado was an immune response. And that's right. what happens when you have a low level immune kind of response going on because your gut's inflamed, you get weird things that happen with blood sugar, cortisol is elevated, anabolic hormones tend to drop. Um, your body, when it's slightly stressed all the time, is not going to try to build muscle. Why would it want to make you depend on more energy and calories when you're in kind of this low-level stress? It's going to try and keep that down. And yeah. then on top of it, one of the biggest safeguards against uh, stress is fat storage. Like for most of human history, if you, you had a lot of fat on your body, it was a nice safety mechanism against famine. Mm -hmm. Well, so what do you think your body does when you're slightly stressed? It promotes fat gain. Yeah. So mm -hmm. for people who want to look better or whatever, uh, it doesn't, it's not a good idea. I also feel like part of the reason why it's 
you know, whether it's not talked about or accepted uh, by the general population as much is because it's this massive mirror for a lot of people. In mm -hmm. my experience, 90% of the time, the food that they're having issues with is a food they love. Of course. Yeah. You know, they eat it all the time. Though. Yes. Yeah. And so it, you saw my cheese results. <laughs> <laughs> it was bullshit. It's really, <laughs> it's, still in boy, it's so hard. I mean, I, I get it. I mean, and that's such a perfect example here. You have somebody like Justin who's uh, fully aware. Right. But then you, you want to be in denial. You want to not accept that there's a really good chance. It's that food that you, you think you're okay because you've been yeah. eating it your entire life, yeah. but it's also most likely because going back to your point about it's, it happens when the gut is inflamed and then it leaks through. If it's a food you eat so commonly, all it takes is a time when that, that gut was inflamed like that and, and yeah. it could leak through it. What's more common, a food that you eat once a year or a food that you eat every, every morning, day, every yeah. day, it's more likely to be something like that. And it's really tough for people to accept it, that that food that they've been eating forever is most likely the culprit. You just bring, you just brought us to kind of another uh, segment of this. How weird was it working with people when, when it comes to diet, how attached people get to certain foods? Of course. Isn't yeah. that weird? Oh yeah. Like, like you'll, you'll have a client who eats a particular diet and they'll still always point out like, you know, I'll change my diet, but I'm not going to take out my- Yes. Chocolate or my morning baby. Chocolate I gotta have my morning or baby. wine. Or you know, yeah, those try to take ones. wine from from the clutches of you know <laughs> yeah. one of your lady yeah. clients. Yeah, well, luck. especially that one because it's used as like a coping mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I mean, I get it. But. Yeah. <laughs> Today's giveaway on YouTube is the RGB bundle. To enter to win, leave a comment below this video. In the first twenty four hours that we drop it, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things, and if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, we have a new sale for the month of August. Maps Bands is 50% off and Maps 40 Plus, also 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Anyway, I got to tell you guys this new thing that my three-year-old does. So he, every day this kid is just cracking us up. So he, um, if he falls, so this is, I, I've never taught him. I didn't show him any of this. I don't know where he gets this from, but when he falls down or, you know, bumps his knee, he doesn't want anybody to know he hurt himself so he'll fall down and he'll pop right back up he'll walk it off no he'll pop up oh i'm fine i'm fine so jessica will always rush over are you okay buddy and this is his response now i'm not bleeding and he walks away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not fine. bleeding I'm, fine. Fine. I'm not bleeding yeah. i'm like what is going on dude my kid, i like that yeah. you don't remind me of that scene from predator where uh what's that guy he was a pro wrestler jesse yeah Ventura. Oh, jesse Ventura. Ventura. yeah where he, he gets hit by the shrapnel and the guy's like, you cut, you're bleeding. He's like, I ain't got time, I got to, time bleed. to bleed. Yeah, so I was like, I'm going to show my kid that Wasn't clip. he a governor for a hot minute? <laughs> In Minnesota. Uh, was it, was that oh, what, yeah. yeah. He was a governor he was for a, a while. senator. Or, I don't know. Yeah, it was something like that. Was he was definitely an office. Was governor. He was governor. The, he was, was governor. You're yeah, right. He, he was okay. the original yeah. conspiracy theorist. Sorry, I doubted you. Yeah. Did you ever watch? You had to have watched the show. He was like oh, yeah, ultimate I did. conspiracy theory. That was the first one out there. Uh, it was, I forget what it was called. I didn't know I, that. Yeah, I even Bro, watched had a show where Joe Rogan deep. explains or everything or something like that. There, he had a show with Duncan Trussell. Yes. That was another one where they actually went to like, um, you know, some of these labs where they were creating viruses and bro, it, dude. And this was all like, I didn't know, know, I didn't know a decade like, or so ago. Bro, these are old episodes in the early two thousands. Right. Mm -hmm. I think where, or maybe like 2010. Dude, go back and watch. You, you see the foreshadowing. He had this, the, yes. He had this woman on the show interesting. and she was talking about gain of function research. Yes. And how, yeah, dude. She was, she was living yeah. in like oh, Costa Rica wow. or something. I, I watched that. Yes. And she basically, she was warning this, everybody wow, that there was going to be a global pandemic. 2009. Bro, she yeah. said, they're going, listen, there's a whole, now I want to watch it. There's a whole thing about this one episode where she goes, yeah. they're going to plan a pandemic. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to release shut this. Up. I yes. swear to God, they're going to shut down the world. It's a prophecy. Yes, dude. How are not more people talking about that then? Because nobody had three cares. seasons back yeah. in 2009. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen it, Doug? Everybody's over. I it. did. Oh, you watched I it? I did see it. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, I normally yeah. lean on you to give me like uh, stuff to watch. Oh, well, this has been a long time a long ago. Time ago. Yeah. 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 No, wow. that, that, whole, that whole episode in particular was a little weird. Yeah. How they how she predicted everything. Oh. So how is it structured? So it's like a documentary. It's like it's a it, series. And in, in, I mean, I never interview people. Yeah. Or is it, okay, he interviews so, people. Yeah. I, I, and are they all topics? Are they all tinfoil hat people? Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. So every oh, yeah. topic oh. is like it's like um, 
uh, what's it called when the chemtrails? That'll be an episode. Well, because uh, he used okay. to be a, a Navy SEAL is that, or a yeah. Army Ranger. No. Yeah, I back he was in the day. A WWE wrestler. He also was. He that. was that too. Uh, that's that's him, what I. That's what I He's an interesting guy. Let's look up his history because he was a legit badass. back in the day. Have you ever heard of stories about him and Arnold uh, on the set of Predator? No. Oh, oh yeah, dude. How they would mess with each other and talk like about who's strong. Can you like imagine play, the right? ego nice. okay. fest that was? So, yeah, let's look at his, his history. I think he was- Is was that what he looks like right now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. But that show- You know I that think, John claude Van Damme was uh, in Predator for a minute? Then he left, right? Yeah. He was the Predator. So, like, they really? originally put him in costume, and it was, like, this really heavy costume, and realized that it was just- garbage he was he was a he was a so navy underwater he was hard to work with so, oh so did he did he bounce on it justin he bounced on it oh i didn't know that yeah jean claude van damme was out like his uh there was too much conflict with him and the director i guess or something you know it's so funny you bring this up i have to share this with the audience because i don't think the audience uh knows this story and i think it's hilarious because i believe today aren't you interviewing oh so let's give the uh, let's give him a little love since i'm gonna make fun of you right now what's the cut what is the 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 podcast it, it's called reels of justice okay so this this yeah. podcast and and correct me if i'm wrong how the, like basically it's set up like it's a uh like a prosecutor and a, yeah, defend, like a courtroom a yeah. courtroom and justin is told like a, a do you get the movie ahead of time yeah, so I, I usually get to pick, and so I kind of give them an idea, and then um, they formulate their argument, and then I try to kind of come in with my argument, and yeah. then yeah, so I'm acting as either the prosecutor or the defender, right? For oh, the that movie for the movie, for the movie. Right? So, so to make a case against or for against the movie. or for, okay. right? Yeah. So this is so Justin did this podcast. This is the second time he's done it, but he did this podcast like. I don't know, a while back. And I remember when Katrina yeah. like called and said, hey, there's this podcast. And Justin's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Like, That's he's, totally yeah, up my alley. Yeah, it's totally up my alley. I'll do that, right? So he's all <laughs> all game to do it. Yeah. And so- What was they, the movie? I was in full character. Hold so, on, what was so, the movie? It was Lost Boys. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, and they're doing Lost Boys, which is obviously a, a favorite movie of Justin's and Sal's. They talk about it all the time, right? So <laughs> Justin, <laughs> Justin gets dressed up for the interview. Yeah. Because you're and, supposed to- well, I don't know if you're supposed to do that. Actually, yeah. you thought they were supposed to do that. <laughs> I thought so yeah, I was going to be on camera. So it was, so a, it was an audio. Like, it was an audio only podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I had a Justin, wig. Justin dude, shows like, up in a wig in a full costume, <laughs> like a <laughs> leather coat, <laughs> no dude. Video. Like the whole thing, man. Just I, was, I was just like, these guys are going to die when uh, they see me. <laughs> Yeah, it's <laughs> just audio. Just Wait, audio. Who did you dress up as? Uh, Were you Keith? Michael? My oh. or not? Not Michael. The uh, um, what's the main guy? Kiefer uh, Sutherland. Kiefer Sutherland. Oh, character. so you were the the main the yeah. vampire guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so great, that dude. Was good, dude. So you got that today, right? Uh, obviously not. You just kept saying you're not Michael. in costume today, right? So you're not no, showing I'm not, up. Okay, I'm not in costume. <laughs> can we tell? Can you tell us what the movie is? What are you defending? Uh, this yeah, time? so I'm I'm actually going to be arguing that uh, Karate Kid is. Um, Oh God! Don't do it. Yeah, I have no, to. You're not that that Johnny's the real hero. No, come on, bro. Yeah, <laughs> dude, Danny Larusso's a little bitch. Yeah. So <laughs> I actually, stuff. I actually think this is kind of like. Have uh, you heard this case before? I think you've made this on the show. It's actually a compelling case. It is because he comes to he comes into town. Yep. He steals Johnny's girlfriend. Steals Johnny's girlfriend. He instigates all these fights. Yeah. Even when they had a truce, he decides to break the truce. He wins with an illegal kick. Uh, also, uh, yeah. So Johnny, Johnny shakes his hand, hands him the trophy at the end. And he's like, great job. Congratulates him. Healthy ego. You know, like here's the thing. Like Danny, the whole time is just like, he just come that guy that comes like from nowhere and he's just disrupting like all his group of friends. Uh, he's coming in he's like the wild card that just came through town and is messing everything up for everybody. Oh. <laughs> it's because you it's actually a really i mean have you heard of an, anybody else who's done something like that it's a pretty original idea for a podcast what oh the, to defend and yeah no i think that's I, I, when justin first told me about it i'm like it's not my style or my thing but i'm like that's actually pretty brilliant so i mean look, look at you one of the most viral or talked about conversations we've had on here is that ever, letting people know that rocky is not a love story it is a love and story. that you will defend <laughs> that Stop it. to the death right, like Sylvester that it is alone said it's a love story I, you don't even hear in the background after the fight if he won or lost. <sighs> He's, it's all about Adrian and him. Come on, it's not a box. But that's my point, though, yeah. is that like that conversation yeah. has carried on to the audience for years yeah. now, right? Since we've had that, 
And so it's a, it's an, it's a, I don't know, an interesting premise to like do a podcast. I thought but yeah, I was, it's a cool, it's fun. Yeah. I mean, it's fun to hear their ideas too. Like, and, and they, they definitely challenge you. So I'm like, I'm going to be getting grilled for this. What idea. was the argument for Lost Boys? What were they trying to say? Oh, uh, they you know, I was just kind of arguing for it and just because I come from the nostalgia, it actually was shot and filmed in, in my hometown. Santa Cruz. Yeah. And what um, they call it in the movie Santa Clarita. Santa Clarita. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I don't know. I just have really good memories of it. And I was trying to kind of portray it and, you know, in the light that I saw it. And it was like, they're just like, just destroying it, you know, because it, it's so cheesy. And it's like the, the, I don't know, the characters just didn't have all this depth and all. And so they get into the nitty gritty and the nuance of, of uh, film and, you know, the way it was shot and like, you know, how good of the actors were and yes, all that kind cool. of stuff. So it's like, I actually learned a lot about the film, even just talking with them about it even more, but yeah. I just liked it. Cause you know, I'm just, I grew up with it and I was a now, fan of it. What's cool. It's audio only. So you, I'm assuming brought notes and you got notes and ready, right? Yeah. So last time I just winged it, which oh, was yeah. horrible. I, that's why I'm surprised to have me back on the show. I was like, <laughs> really? You guys <laughs> want me back? Bro, you get so this much, my jam. so much grace. Did you see the post on the, for the private forum talking about it? No. Justin's a, Justin's a national treasure. The way he tells stories. He's like the worst storyteller <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Like, Where is you, that? I haven't seen it. It's that. on the forum right now. It's like like a hell of people. Dude, you guys are, always oh bash God, me in my so, stories, dude. They're horrible. You know, it is. <laughs> yeah, you guys keep saying that. This it's is made me better. This is how you tell a story. I'm better this now. I mean, obviously, stories. I'm alone yeah. on this because everybody else thinks so. This is how you tell a story. The beginning, then you jump to the middle, and then you jump to somewhere around the end. And we're like, what? Yeah. How'd you get there? Yeah. yeah, what ended up happening? Choose your own adventure. No, you know what it is? You tell good stories. You know what it is? When stuff happens to you that's crazy, for some reason, you don't tell us well that's it i because i can't get a word in edgewise damn that's he's got a good point there. where does age <laughs> you're gonna fuck yourself one of these days we're gonna <laughs> turn these mics on and hey, it's gonna be like this stop talking also i don't want it you know? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or the whole podcast like, what do you think no. justin yeah, what do you think dude. what do you think? I, I have more fun destroying your guys ideas yeah, yeah. that's that makes me did, happy. did you watch um have you watched all the seasons of cobra kai no, um, I'm not caught after, up. Oh, they, yeah. They just caught up. Like, uh, there's a new season that's out that yeah. just dropped. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I like I like the first and second, and I was kind of going uh, with those those uh, series. But it kind of fell off for me. Dude. Yeah, same. You know, got my, a little wacky. Dude, you I, know, it was my, a little too much. I thought yeah. it was a little much. My, daughter's, little hooky. my yeah. daughter's super into it. She's a huge Karate Kid fan. And then we were just talking about this. She's a massive Rocky fan. So she has a Rocky poster. I know my 14 year old is making wow, me just every day. I'm going to cry. Seriously. She's got a, a Rocky poster in her room. And then we were watching montages like Rocky four training montage. And we're watching it. And, and so my three-year-old again, he's watching it and he goes, he has a tree on his back. He's so strong. And I'm like tearing up. Like, this is <laughs> every child of mine likes yeah. it. Yeah. So good. I got something, Justin, that you'll like. I just saw it. Have you ever heard? It's called, I put it in my notes. It's uh, called the Glacier View Car Launch. What? No, what? Is Dude. That? Doug, pull it up so these guys can see a video of this. So I, I believe it happens every year on 4th of July. It's like a, a paid event. You get tickets for it. goes in. And they literally launch cars off this cliff. And people all sit around and watch them just- Into what? Yes. Into like a, a ravine. And wow. just, yes, comes down flying off. Like watch, Doug will put the video Do on Do they right put now. any bombs in them or anything? Well, like, I've seen some of them catch fire. So yes. uh, yeah, no, they're, it's crazy that they, they even allow them to do this. Look at this. Wow. Every 4th of July, this is like a, and it's like a growing <laughs> event, right? It's been going on for years now. And, and where that cars, they just leave them there? They just... Yeah, I, I didn't do that. I, like I didn't look Oh, up, that like, is so cool. Wow. I totally, everybody wants to see that. Yeah. yeah. There's so many better videos than what Doug pulled up. Oh. Hey, Andrew, are you working over there or what? <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. I yeah, feel like I'd want to get one of those uh, Cadillac convertibles, put some dummies in there like Thelma and Louise and just, you know. Just launch them. Uh, that is, uh, I mean, right. so I mean, I think it's kind of cool. I think they do it in the middle of the day, right before 4th of July. And it's like a big event. Look, you see all the people down there? Like they sell tons of tickets to this. Look at that. That's so rad. It's massive. It's because everybody Do wants they to clean see it. it up or they leave like the debris? I imagine they have to clean it up, right? There's it. no way that someone would, it looks like a national park. There's no way they would allow you like to do something like this and. <laughs> And wow. then, and it's not such an it. American idea. Yeah, I love throw, that shit. Did I tell you guys one? I had a friend that pushed a, uh, this this abandoned car down the foothills. I hope I'm not getting anyone in trouble. This was back in the day. So what's the statute yeah. of limitations? You put you pushed a car, not me. Oh, I had some friends that did it. That was like an abandoned car at the top of the foothills. Oh, what, it, dude? There it was just places down. we knew where where people would just just ditch their car like that and then just drive it right off. 
uh, like up in Boulder Creek, especially there was this one like dead end, uh, that it would just, was a collection on a pile of cars. I swear. Like everybody knew about it for some reason. This is where like you ditch your car. It, is it true? You might've told me this, Adam. Is it true that, uh, Lake Tahoe has some of the highest rates of boats yeah. sinking because yeah, yeah. people do that for insurance? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So what do they do? They just drive it out. Well, part part of the reason why is because you, they never can re recover it. Right? It's so deep, so deep. So they they yeah, it's like a common uh, insurance scam that a lot really? of people, yeah, a lot of people because it's it's actually a, like a common mistake that people do. I can't tell you how many times that uh, we've been out on the boat and oh, we forgot to put the plug back in because every time you come out from a boat, like so. There gets like a little bit of water in the engine bay oh. and like just part of the process of pulling a boat out and cleaning it up and doing your okay. stuff is you pull the plug. Okay. You pull the plug and then you allow, you allow the water that's around okay. the engine to drain. And then after it all drains and you clean up your boat, you know, you put your plug back in and then, but it's happened. It's common that people forget to do that. And then of course, but now what ends up happening most of the time is you start to notice we're taking on a little bit of water in the engine bay and you solve it and get out of there. But like, who's to say that you didn't notice it for long enough and then it sinks. And so it's like a really popular you know, insurance scam in the in the boat world, especially when you talk about how expensive boats are, how fast the they, lose, oh, they yeah. lose their value and everything like that. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of people, and there's even a whole business on people that actually go get those boats and then fix them back they up because them. they literally are great, <laughs> nice boats that someone just pulled. They didn't get destroyed or broken. I mean, they got obviously water damage, but I mean, the rest of the boat is actually is, great. Is is Lake Tahoe one wow. of the deepest? Lakes, yeah, pretty deep. Yeah, it's one of it's one of if not sixteen hundred feet deep. Wow, I believe I've it. seen like cool images of like where they compare it to How like deep. It's like Crater Lake. Is that, that that's a, that's actually a little bit deeper? I think. Uh, oh, is sure. it? Yeah, I think it's like maybe eighteen hundred. I'm not sure for exactly. But, wow, I've seen but, an image before that compared like some of the deepest lakes and Tahoe's up there. What are you laughing? So, because I moved to Tahoe, you live there. Yeah, I live there, and so I had two roommates, and we said we're going to buy a boat. And so uh, one weekend, my one roommate and myself, we were leaving out of town. So the other roommate said, hey, I'm going to take the boat out. So as we're driving out of the driveway, he comes running down the street wet. Oh. He goes, the boat sunk. That actually happened? He did. He sunk our boat. Wow. Uh, yeah. So he had forgotten to put the plug in. See, yeah. yeah. So he took it out. He, we had a pier close to our house. Yeah. He drove it to our pier wow. and he, you know, he, he docked it there. And then he went out and all was sticking out was the bow of the boat. And so- and What was, do you do at that point? You just so you, you hire a company, they come, they, they pull the boat out, and then you have to obviously, you know, uh, fix the engine because it's got yeah. water in it. Yeah. And so there's a process there. So wow. Basically, if there's more damage, just like with a car, right? If there's more damage mm -hmm. than what it's worth, then they'll total it, and then they'll pay out for an insurance. But now you get why it's such a, uh, you know- a common scam is because it it happens. Ha it happens. Oh, it happens. It happens a, a lot to people, or like relatively a lot in comparison to like other things that and happen. And another thing is Tahoe. Mm. When it gets windy, it gets extremely rough. It's yeah. like the, the water. Does. It's like the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people have their boats on buoys, and what happens is, I mean, they some of them sink. Wow. Yeah. Oh, dude. Speaking of water, do you, okay. Do you guys remember that movie, The Abyss? Yeah. It was like nineteen ninety or something like that. Eighty nine. Yeah. So that in that movie, if you haven't watched it, did you watch that movie? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, Dude, pull up the first underwater alien movie. Oh, it was it, sick. I mean, yeah. I remember the cover of it. It's like the, it's like the, it's a picture of someone like diving. Yeah, super, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's you go trippy concept. They're, they're trying to get to like the deepest parts of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. And one of the ways they did it was they, they had this new liquid that you could breathe in and it would provide, because one of the challenges with going deep is obviously the pressure mm -hmm. on something that has air or oxygen in it. So they oh, developed yeah. this liquid that they would breathe in so they could breathe in this liquid and then go super deep. To kind of depressurize you. Do you yeah. know that they invented that? Really? Okay, but it's not like that though. It's an injection. They actually invented an injection that will supply you with oxygen so you don't have to breathe. What? what? Yes. Yes, in possible? 2017. Stop it. I swear. What, now, it's not having like to test embryonic on, fluid? They, like, they, what is this? They tested it on animals. So you literally inject, and I can't remember. I don't. I don't know how the science works, but you they give this the animal injection, and the animal can survive without breathing because they get enough oxygen. What a for trip. obviously just a certain period of time. Well, I. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the details are, but how crazy is that? Yeah, yeah. where you, you could just get an injection of of whatever. And and I read into the science. I don't understand it, but something along the lines of that the the oxygen is encapsulated in a way so it doesn't. Uh, damage your tissues when you. Who's going to be the first to try that? Well, they got to test it on animals and stuff. First. Yeah. Who knows? This is 2017. <laughs> the military probably might already have something oh, like this. Poor bastard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wait. What is this? 15 oh. to 30 minutes. Yeah. Medical. Oh, so that's why they use it. That's right. 
So when you have respiratory failure, people whose lungs aren't working or collapsed, or uh, like Bizy they'll time. inject them with this and it'll give them uh, 15 to 30 minutes. Why would that not be like a, a replace AED machines or something like that when, or be lit with it? You would think that would be now something in the future that we would just have with like an AED kit. Like you bring that out and you inject them in, in addition to doing Because I, I don't know if it's been 100%. It says right there that the solution has already been successfully tested on animals under critical lung failure. Huh. Mm. So I don't know if they've done it, if it's approved yet for humans. Yeah. But I mean. Because then like transporting them and then putting them on, what is like an iron lung at that point you would set them up on? Oh, no, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But he's right because like if you get like heart failure mm -hmm. or cardiac arrest, mm -hmm. you're not getting oxygen, boom, inject right. somebody. It would be, be, you would think that if this gets approved or, or whatever it needs to get through as far as the process of, of like everybody adopting it, that would become like the next thing that would be right next to the AED machine. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as that. If I it's could extending 15 to 30 minutes. Most. Uh, you know, like most ambulances are there by that, or fire you know, fire teams or whatever that are normally there by that by that time, right? Yep, yep. So that's interesting. Yeah, I'm. I'm I wonder how the military. Hmm. I mean, I'm sure they would use it for like sneak attack or whatever. Oh yeah, like, like seals would use it. Yeah, to, just underwater, just like a, you know, like a shark. Yeah, not having a trip. Already <laughs> doing crazy shit like that. Yeah, cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, also reminds me of another study. Did you know that? So they they've identified that dogs will change their behavior based off of who they're around and what they smell in the sense that they can smell uh, fear and apprehension, literally. <laughs> They'll pick up on it. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. then they, their behavior will be more pessimistic based off of their, because dogs evolved. So this is, this is what tripped me out of it. Dogs evolved to be so interconnected with humans that they read our cues. So if they smell fear in you, they themselves become more pessimistic with their behaviors and actions because they smell the fear. I mean, that is not, I mean, part of the reason why there's so many dog bites and attacks is because people that already are it's afraid their, and fearful yeah, of the dog energy, and yeah. then the dog barks or like that and then they they ele it elevates or heightens their their sense their feeling and fear and then that just heightens the dog even further and then you end up getting attacked versus being calm and relaxed right totally yeah no, yeah because they can also i know this that they, that dogs can smell uh, or sense a seizure before it occurs yeah so they have um companion dogs that they'll give to epileptics <laughs> Well, are they like, then we'll know how to per turn the old person over and make sure they don't choke. Are there specific pheromones or things that they, they pick up on for fear that like yeah. you're excreting? Yeah. It really? has to be that. Yeah. It has to be that, right? Yeah. That's the only I thought I always thought it was more of a uh like a mannerisms. You no, know, like they could pick up on your your movement and like your um focus on them and it's gotta be pheromone type stuff. It's, right? sm it's smell. It's smell. Yeah, they yeah. identified wow. it as smell. That's so that's so fascinating. Yeah, yeah you talk about animal stuff. <laughs> I forgot. This was like something I was gonna bring up. I actually should probably get a fact check. So but I saw the video and it looked very real to me. Have you seen the elephant that paints? Yeah. Oh. Have you seen it? I have seen it. Is it real? Is that real? It was real. Yeah. What? Yeah. Dude, so you gotta see this. Um like, so like, like legit good painting. It, it, yeah. Yeah, we'll paint himself. Like, yes, in, what? In, yes, in trees and yes, yes. Wow. You saw the same it's, it's thing I trippy. saw. That. Yeah. So and there, yeah. And I, I looked into that, and and it's interesting because the I don't know what you call a group of elephants, like a pack or a herd, herd? or something. Herd. Yeah. So they they punked them because of yes it, because yes. it was getting attention and so they all like and it was a smaller it was yes. like a young elephant yeah, right? yeah you they, totally like, okay you read the same thing they I did punked okay. them like hard and so they had to oh, really? isolate them they were jealous at the zoo yeah they're yeah. jealous. Wow. And they had to isolate him so he could get back to his painting. This is crazy, dude. Yeah. I saw this. And I'm like, there's no way he painted that. And it's-, it's So like a, pictures, you know what they are. Oh, dude. Yeah. He draw. He paints himself. I mean- And he paints like scenery pictures that are, I mean- It's cooler than a lot of those Jackson Pollock. That is Pollock. so yeah. I mean, it's not Bob Ross, but I mean, it's like solid. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. I mean, solid. not a lot of people- that can It's actually probably better than what I would paint. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, so it's not bad. It's- yeah, hopefully. Here's a fluffy little cloud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some happy trees. Did you guys watch Bob Ross when you were kids? Oh, of course. Oh, uh, yeah. Did yeah, you really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it annoyed me. The happy trees. Oh, really? I hated it because uh, it usually came on when cartoons were over or something like that. Oh, I remember it okay, signaled yeah. like it shows was, were done. It was soothing. Yeah. Yeah, wait till you see this, this, dude. Dude, this is All wild. the hippies became like the kid show uh, front men. Yeah. Yes. yes. Like, it, it was interesting. Do you guys, okay, did you guys, were you guys big Saturday morning cartoon? Yeah. People? Of course. Do you guys remember what show would come on that would signify that cartoons it was over? Are done? Yeah. In Saturday. Soul Train. 
Yes. Yeah, every, oh, I hate Every that. time. Woo. Oh, yeah. oh, it's over. <laughs> no more snorks. Yeah, I hate it. It sucks. Oh, stupid soul I can't believe you remember that. I don't remember that. I don't yeah, remember Stupid what. train will come on yeah. and you'd be like, oh, it's over, guys. Yeah. Bunch of weird people trying to boogie. Yeah, Saturday morning was cereal and cartoons for me. Mm -hmm. Every single We Saturday only got morning. from like what? I'd say like 8 a.m. to about 11. Right? It wasn't like all, it was like only till oh, like. Oh, bro, you could get up earlier and there were some cartoons. Uh -huh. I started oh, going as early as like 6, eight, six or 7 a.m. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Wow, what was going on at that time? Voltron. Yes. Yeah, usually. Yes. Yeah. God, bro, you I and I feel, would have been. I feel like I caught Voltron. It's That's buddies. the only thing I pay attention to. <laughs> yeah, dude. Dude, I know I know. Doug picked the slowest video on Earth, but look at this thing. Is starting <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, it takes him a while. Can you tell it's already coming together? I mean, like, but look at those lines. You know what? He it's, sucks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's already has Did you know elephants goose each other? Goose each other? Yeah. you know. Like, you know, what do you mean? Like, stick their trunk up another? Their Their horn. They'll go up behind each other and like look at look at this. Tell other. me, that, look how good that is. He actually made. Tell me, you could paint that better than that. You know what they use to scratch their belly? Yeah. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah. I've they seen don't. a video. And it's, is that actually, true? It's horrifying. They don't actually use it though. Bro, look, oh look, yeah, bro. Are you not like blown away yeah, by like the an detail this, this guy is putting together here? Yeah, I am. Well, you know why you sold? You told me so much about it before I saw it. Now I knew. You know, oh, I should have undersold you it. You should have just said, like, yeah. "Hey, this elephant kind of draws." Like, watch what this. You guy probably does. wouldn't be paying attention. It's got. It's a male. No, I'm serious. That, like, that is belly. unbelievable to me. That he can, he's been trained to draw that accurate of a picture. It's, what what's weird is that that signifies a, 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 a type of a self aware consciousness. Yeah, that's intelligent. Exactly. That, I mean, I, why, am I the only one that's like so blown away by that? Yeah. Yeah. You that's know, crazy. El elephants mourn; they're dead. Also, yep. Do you know that? If so, they'll so if someone dies, you bury it, whatever. They'll revisit the bones. I mean, after seeing this, I'm not surprised mourn. at all. I mean, look, that's crazy to me. Yeah, that an that an animal would would be self aware enough to draw a picture of himself. Yeah, and and then to, and originally when I think I first saw the article, I'm like, okay, what well, it's gonna be like blotches, and they're like, oh yeah, look at the <laughs> elephant can play. It's like cool, you cool. know what I'm saying? But I mean, that, I I do not think I could draw a better elephant. It's legible. I'm almost positive I couldn't draw. No, a you are pretty bad at, at drawing. Yeah. Would you Would you want <laughs> an elephant for a pet? That would be cool. An elephant? Yeah, I'd have to have a really big house. You get clean shit. You would leave it yeah. and you keep it in the house. Well, I mean, you'd have to have a, a big piece of property. Yeah, you know? so I definitely wouldn't want a little tiny uh, yeah. uh, trailer and an, on a, yeah. with a, an elephant living I nearby. Feel like nobody would, would ever mess with your property if you had an elephant. Do you You think they're intimidating? Elephants? No, yeah. I'm not denying how strong they are. But I'm like, I don't, I don't think they're that intimidating. Oh, like, bro, you should read about the battles of like, uh, the, 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 was it who is it the, the barbarians? I mean, I know the they rode them. I know they're powerful. I know all those things yeah, about them, but people. they don't strike me as like you roll up on a house to rob and you're like, oh shit, he's got an elephant. Let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, wait, hold on. Like, I'm pretty hold sure on. that if you're you had in, like two pit bulls that you're are in San Jose. Yeah. You roll up. There's an elephant. <laughs> yeah, for sure you're getting um, the hell out of no there. No way. Bro. If I roll up, I'm like, you probably got a Bengal tiger yeah, back yeah, there somewhere yeah. or something. Dude. Why is there an elephant here? Well, the, okay, that might be a good point. Okay, so if I see an elephant, uh, that, look at look how crazy that is. Yeah, that is wild. That is like really good. That is pretty wild. Really yeah. good. No, no like, so if I roll up and I see it, I'm a rob a house. And I see an elephant. I'm not like, oh shit, there's an elephant. I'm more like, he might have a tiger. Like I might, yeah. like that's. So. I feel like you'd be so confused, you would not go into the house. Okay, fair. But my point was that it's not yeah. intimidating. Like you may yeah. sound like, oh, that'd be sick. Like intimidate people with. Yeah. Like, well, you ever watch those videos of like <laughs> elephants, big spike color elephants gone wild or anything like that? Have you seen those? <laughs> no, it's like girls gone wild. <laughs> elephants <laughs> gone wild. What are you watching, dog? <laughs> yeah. What are you watching? I'm into some weird stuff. Right? <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah. Wow. That would, that Google would... elephants gone. Wild. Yeah, yeah. Take it, put it on. Yeah. Yeah. Put, take off safe search. Look uh, at the yeah. images. No, uh, we're already flagged for our goat. Hey, search. can you just fast forward to the very end of this? Since we already, I want to see like. Why the is there goat. more? Well, no, he's more detail. Like, it, I mean, it's like it looks. I don't know if this is the one that has the like oh, all the yeah. scenery and yeah, stuff like, like that. But like, since we clicked on the like whole video here, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they make I reels mean, that are like this is like long. real time <laughs> video here. <laughs> I see that. It's, wow, he's, he's, he's like a trees. second grader. You know, like it's bro. That is better than some of my kids. Way drawings. better than a second grader. That's how you. Should I is that how you? That's how I you don't can, think any of you could draw a better picture than that. That's how you can shame your kids into doing better in school. Yeah, look, look, he's doing balloons. No, those. That's a flower. Or something like that. Nice I mean, job, Mr. Elephant. I mean, that's okay, just... Maybe. That's so you've crazy. never seen videos of He's elephants of, 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 that were there, like, part gone. of a circus, and then they, they just... Oh, get, I have seen that. You ain't stopping an elephant, yeah, bro. Yeah. You ain't stopping one. They push a car over like... I mean, that's... I, okay, I'm not arguing the point that they're unbelievably strong, but they just don't... Like, push if I, if I had to make a list of mm -hmm. the 10 most intimidating... In fact, if anybody made a list, the 10 most intimidating uh, uh, animals, pretty sure elephant doesn't make the top 10. 
Elephant hippo. Those are hippo. Hippo. I'm yeah. telling you guys, yeah. hippos are still they're def- aggressive. Oh, definitely, be- a moose would even pass that. Like a moose is scary too. Oh, like yeah. that's. I just don't think elephants don't come across as, you know, why? Because they paint. They look cute. It, well, yeah, they really don't. Because a yeah. Dumbo. Dumbo makes everybody yeah. feel comfortable now. Well, I'm gonna take a. a I'm gonna take a turn here. I want to ask you about something I heard you talking uh, about Disney. earlier. Adam, so earlier today we were doing some advertising stuff and and you were talking to some of our partners and one of the questions they asked you, I thought it was a really good question, was the commonalities between leadership or what does leadership and coaching or training people have in common? I thought that was a really good question. Now, first off, did you tell them to ask you that question or was that on the No, I didn't tell them. Did you tell them to ask you the question they asked you? Yeah. Oh, you did? <laughs> Here's where you I'm would, best. You wouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Ask me these questions. Yeah, I'm yeah. really good yeah, at it. You'll like what these. I have yeah. to say. <laughs> no, so what, so what were some of the things that you, because I, 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 when I heard the question, I'm like, oh, yeah, like there's a lot in common with leading a team, leading a family, and training a client, working with a client. It's very similar yeah, in yeah. that sense. I mean, we kind of talked about it, I felt like, the other day. When, I don't know what conversation we were having, but- you know, you had brought something up and I had pointed out that, you know, that reminds me of one of my favorite leadership quotes, which is, you know, first rule of being a leader is everything is your fault. And when ultimately when you are, and that's now, that's obvious, right? When you talk about a team and you're leading a team or a SEAL team, any sort of a team, like, okay, that everyone understands the leadership role there. I don't think a lot of times people think of that. It's really the same thing when you're coaching a client. The only difference is, is it's a two man, two man or man and woman team. That's it. It's just you, it's you and I as the, 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 in this team. And obviously if you hired me as a coach and trainer, I'm the leader of this team. And therefore, if anything goes wrong, you don't show up to appointments, you don't follow the diet, you don't perform the exercises correctly. You, you don't adhere to the advice. It's my fault. It's my fault. If you weren't effective. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you, and, if, and unfortunately, a lot of people are thrusted into leadership roles and they don't have a leadership mentality. They have that, like, I got promoted, so I'm a manager, and so you're supposed to just do what yeah, I say. Yeah. But a true leader is somebody who can not only lead by example, but then also takes the responsibility of all the losses. You know, um, when a good leader is not somebody that demands uh, to be heard or followed, a good leader is somebody that people want to follow. Yeah. They simply Models want it. to. Yeah. And I think when you're an effective coach, in fact, this is for people listening right now, if you're looking for a good trainer, one of the attributes, there's a lot of things you want to look for. So it's not just this, but this is one of them is does this person, do you want to follow their lead? Do you want to take their advice? Do you want, do you feel like this is somebody that you could trust on this journey? Because you are going to be making, potentially making big fundamental changes and how you live, everything from diet to sleep to even uh, more importantly, how you view yourself in relationship to things like fitness and nutrition. And so if you feel like you're just being barked at or told what to do, if if it feels that way, probably not a good trainer for you. But if this trainer makes you feel like, man, I want to follow this individual, which requires what? Trust, humility, vulnerability. Yes. The most important yeah. Things. I mean, and listen, this is really powerful for, you know, uh, the people that are listening that think that they are the leader in their home too. I mean, this is a practice that is, is difficult for a lot of people to do with their spouse. For example, if you truly believe that you are the leader of your family and you and your spouse are arguing or disagreeing about something like that, like if you're truly a good leader, you take full responsibility always. Mm-hmm. So, and, and if, can you, can you like in the heat of a moment in an argument with your spouse, uh, take that responsibility of saying like, you know what? I, I failed you. I failed you. I didn't communicate well enough. I didn't do this well enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I understand why you're mad or I understand. Even when you like on the outside, from the outside looking in, it looks like the other person's fault for sure that they did X, Y, and Z. But if you really consider yourself the leader of that family, the leader of that team, then just like it would be for a, a coach who's taking responsibility of a loss, just like a, a coach or a trainer would take the responsibility of a client not getting their goals, the same thing works in your household is that, hey, like, I, I failed us. I failed us as a dad. Like, I didn't I didn't obviously explain why this was so important, mm-hmm. why we should have done this way. I didn't communicate well enough. I didn't spend enough time. I didn't show you, whatever it may be. But I mean, it's such a good exercise that if you believe that about yourself uh, and your family, that, hey, the next time you have some adversity or a challenge or a, an argument or a fight with your spouse, try leading the conversation with that. It's tough to do and in, mm-hmm. in those moments. And so can you take responsibility yeah. uh, for all failures you of know, the team? I, I had some really good mentors coming up in the fitness industry. And I, I rem- there's some examples that pop up of, 
uh, where you saw that leadership come through. Like I remember my first mentor, Don, um, I remember at the time, so this was the late nineties, uh, at the time that the club we worked 24 fitness where we started. And at the time they had, they, we had porters that cleaned the club. We had trainers, we had salespeople, but I remember they made, they made this big push for everybody to make sure that they took responsibility for the cleanliness of the club because they had realized that this was a big, this is a big reason why people don't, uh, that cancel their memberships is if a gym doesn't seem orderly or clean. And instead of hiring, you know, a million more porters, which would have been just not very good. It's like, have everybody take ownership. Well, you try telling personal trainers who just think they're trainers or salespeople who just think they're sales. Hey, I want you to pick up a rag and clean the equipment or, right. or everybody's like, oh, I'm not going to do that. Whatever. Right. So I'll never forget Don, you know, one of his first days is, is my general manager. I had another GM before that only for a few months. Then he pops in <clears> and I never forget. He pulled up his sleeves. He grabbed some rags, grabbed some cleaning supplies and he was just, cleaning equipment out and, and, and didn't say anything to anybody. And then he came out and said, Hey, come give me a hand. Mm -hmm. And it was very natural for you to follow his lead oh, yeah. because he was, you out feel there guilty if you didn't, after you, just, it. you just, you see your boss doing it and not doing it like, you know, like legitimately doing it yeah. and then inviting you. And, uh, it was very, very powerful. I mean, the, again, to the people that are leading a team, like let's say in business, like try this the next time. Like we tend to do this right with a staff member or someone that like, let's say somebody on the team, fail to do an edit correctly or spell something right. Like instead of saying like you did this wrong or you messed up here or look at this mistake, I failed to communicate to you how important it was to me for this, like lead with that and watch how powerful and how much they, how much better they receive the, the, the criticism versus you going in there and telling them you fucked up, yeah. you did this wrong, whatever, and pointing those things out versus you taking ownership of their failure. Mm -hmm. You do that and watch how powerful it is even for an employee, the way they will receive that information and correct those behaviors. And so I don't know that, that, that skill, uh, probably something that, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I learned the hard way being raised in, in my household, then being thrusted into leadership, obviously being 40 something years old, I'm able to unpack it now, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and like reflect on like mm -hmm. all these things and these situations, you know, one of the most memorable, uh, conversations I ever had, and it, it kind of is similar to this, this conversation, um, Dean Pappas who I think you would agree was probably one of the better. Oh, he was one of my, one of my favorite mentors. Right. Yeah. And, you know, of all the conversations that I've had with him and, and interactions, you know what the one that I can like viv vividly remember that stands out the most to me was I was, it was in the second year that I won the Hawaii competition, right? So every year, if you were yeah. top performer, you go to Hawaii. And, you know, I would meet uh, VPs and stuff like that. The company's massive, right? So you meet all these big wigs when you're at th events like this. And so many times uh, I would meet one and, you know, they would, oh, hey, man, great. You know, they, they hype me up when they see me. And you could just see right through, like, he don't know who the hell I am. Yeah. Like, he doesn't know who I am. Like, yeah. he don't even, I bet you have asked him what club I'm running. He has no idea what club I'm running. Like, he's, it was totally fake. You could just feel that. And I'll never forget the first time that uh, I, my encounter with Dean Pappas like this. And he goes, he, uh, I was at the bar and um, he sent a, a drink over to me and then it came over to me and then he walked over to me and he, uh, he opened the conversation with apologizing for not remembering who I was. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, I know I'm real. Yeah, yeah. dude, that, I remember that forever. And I'm, I've thought later in life, like, why was that such an, like, he didn't teach me anything amazing. He didn't hype me up and tell me how awesome I was. Like, why was that so impactful? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. You know why? Because the humility, right? Mm -hmm. He humbled himself to admit his fault or his wrong where, and as a leader, you know, like, hey, I, you know, I know I, I should know you because I've seen you before, uh, but but I don't remember what your name is. Can you remind me? He also showed value in you and, and showed that he cared, right? It, it, by doing that. My, would, yeah, pulled you in. My other favorite quote, right? Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And so coming from that was like, wow, what a powerful thing. And I just think that Unfortunately, I and mean, we see this in leaders in our country and leadership in big companies and people that are in these positions, like that's rule number one. Rule number one is everything is your fault. And if you're going to be a really effective, good trainer and coach, you have to learn to do this. It's always a sign to me when I have a, a, a weak trainer, when you know the client didn't resign or they didn't get the results and I'm inquiring like, hey, what happened? What's going on? Yeah, blame it on the and client. all they do is list all the stuff about them. Mm -hmm. Oh, they never showed up to their appointments and oh, they, they never did excuses. this. Oh, they don't have money. Oh, they don't like they, they give me all this list of excuses versus being like, you know what? 
I could have, you know what I didn't do? Yeah. I didn't do this, or I could have done or this better. I couldn't better. figure it out. I right, right. figure out how to do. Yeah, just or own it, right? Like, you know, man, I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to figure out where I went wrong or yep. what I could have done better. Like, mm -hmm. just that attitude, like, tells me so much about you know, I, the I, trainer working for I me. I had this, uh, th and you figure this out as a coach th through years and years and years of really how to get good at getting people to that point. Because you, if you don't get them to that point, you know, if this is now, if this is for trainers listening. If you can't get a client to the point where they trust you, uh, where they want to follow your lead, you're not going to be you're not going to be able to succeed with this. It's very very difficult. And so through the years, you just kind of start to figure out what works and what helps with this and whatever, and how to read certain things. And I remember I had this client, this woman that would show up at my studio, and she was intimidated, intimidated by working out, intimidated by the other people in the gym. And I've been around that before, and I I knew what that was like. And so I started scheduling her at times when people weren't there. Then I started turning the lights down in the studio. Then I, I sectioned off one part of the gym, which was in the front, in the corner. Just her and I would just work with one pair of dumbbells. And I remember later on, this is after years of working with her, and she became you know really well-versed, and this became something that she did on her own even. I remember her telling me, like, you know how, how big of a, what, what a big deal it was that you scheduled me when no one else was there and you turned the lights off in the studio? when I would come in to work out because you knew it would make me feel whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like those types of things right there. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't me saying you got to just, you know, show up like who cares? Come in, yeah. don't worry about it, whatever. It was yeah. like, I had to meet her where she was. Yeah. Um, and she knew how much I cared and yeah. you're right. And then she yeah. was willing to take those extra steps. I don't know, you know why. I don't know why we don't, why this is not more part of our curriculum because I give me, I don't care what you do for a profession. Uh, it doesn't matter. Like the, I, this, those skill sets, uh, like they transfer, they carry over to every, so many aspects of your life. Yeah. So whether you're- Especially an, relationships. Whether, exactly. Yeah. That's what you, exactly. Because of relationships, that matters so much and everything you'll ever do in life requires that. I don't yeah. care if you have a solo All interactions job. with people yeah. require that communication. Yeah. And, and hopefully at one point you're married and have children and things like that, like that. And that requires the ability to lead a household. And probably one of the hardest things when you have a marriage is yeah. like understanding that, okay, if I'm going to lead this family, part of that is through humility and mm -hmm. accepting when and taking the failures when you fail and celebrating the other person when the, the yeah, success. Because otherwise it builds up content. And That's right. It builds up all this resentment. And, you know, if you just, again, it's the whole clean your own room kind of mentality. It's like, if you just look at it yourself, it's like, okay, where what's my role in this? What's my responsibility in yes. this? Where is this going wrong that I can look at and, and be able to address uh, just personally, it's going to be so much more effective because then again, too, you're, you're leading that the other person sees that that's your go-to. They're going to take, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're going to follow along and then that's just going to be, become a healthier relationship as a, a result of you modeling it. This was one of the most <clears throat> attractive qualities of Katrina when we first got together uh, like any relationship, it's inevitable at one point you're going to disagree or argue about something, right? And I remember the way we handled like the very first time and everyone since then where it's like, you know, oh, obviously there's tension. We don't agree. We're arguing about something. Like, okay, we recognize we're not getting anywhere. Take a, a breather from talking to each other right now and then we'll reconvene. And normally it's, you know, shortly after, not very long. We never let a night go by or anything like that. And then when we would reconvene, I remember the way she would always start the conversation. It was always... And, and there's times where I know like, man, I fucked up. That was something I probably shouldn't have done. Or I, I, you know, I was out of line there or whatever. And yet she would lead with, you know, I, this is where I failed you as a partner or this, I wish I did. I'm sorry. And apologizing for what she did wrong, even in the, in the, in the face of us knowing it was my bad. And the same thing was true, vice versa. Like, so when we would go break apart, I would be thinking of like, oh man, what did I not do? How did I, how did we get here that I allowed this to escalate to this point? What could I have done better? And how did I fail her? And then when we get back, that's what I'm talking about. It was mm -hmm. like, man, when I, when I felt that from a, a spouse, a partner like that, I knew like, this is the woman I'm going to be with the rest of my life because just with simply how she approaches problems in our life. And so, so important. That's awesome. All right. I'm going to take a right here. Um, okay. You know, the peptide GHK See you. We've yes. talked about this many yes. times. Yes. Um, you used it for a while for psoriasis. I still I still use it daily. Skin okay. healing. So peptide. you can inject it or you can apply it on your skin. And you know how when you inject it, it can hurt. Yeah. It's it can, it's one of the more painful peptides yes. to inject. Okay. When you when you inject it. You know why? No, why is that? Okay. So it is a signaling peptide that your body produces after injury. 
So when you get an injury, when you get inflammation, mm -hmm. when you get some kind of tissue damage, your body releases GHKCU, which tells the body heal. Mm. So when you inject it, it's like a pain. Oh my God. Response. Like, that's Problem why. area. Let's address this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, cancerous activity, inflammation, damage releases GHKCU. GHKCU then signals the body to heal. So, yeah. uh, so this is why it's such a great uh, peptide to use on your skin. Apply it to your skin. You don't actually have damage, but your body gets the idea that, oh, I need to heal the skin. Yeah. And then you get smoother skin. You get skin that looks healthy. Yeah. Like as if it's been healing from yeah. something. As, it's, if it, as if it's adapting yeah. from stress. So huh. long story short, <clears throat> we have that, the the Intera skincare products. It's, it's in the blue bottle. That's the one with GHKCU. So yeah. that's why the yeah. cream is blue or whatever. My daughter, throughout the summer, she's been going out to tan. And she's like really, she's a 14-year-old girl, so... Hair needs to look good. Skin is like whatever. So she goes outside, gets a little bit of sunburn on her face. So this is like a tragedy. Okay? She comes in, <laughs> little red. Yeah, oh God, God forbid. Oh, it's a big deal. Oh my God, if I start peeling, what am I going to do? I'm like, you know, and I'm trying not to like, <laughs> trying not to disregard her feelings or sure. whatever. Because it's very easy for me to be like, you're fine. But I'm like, right, okay, right. let's see. So I'm like, hey, I got this cream. Let's use it on your face. Because have you, oh, you guys haven't seen this. The data on GHKCU and uh, sunburn. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's wild. It's hmm. wild. Like you'll put it on and the next day, you, the next day your sunburn is almost gone or gone. Wow. wow. So her little cheek, her cheeks and her nose were red. <sighs> so I got the Antera, put them on. I did this with my niece. I'll have to stock uh, up on that. <laughs> so Yes, dude. So, so I did this for my niece too. So my niece, when really she was visiting, skin, yeah. she, now she's very uh, uh, light complected and yeah. she got kind of sunburned. And so she put it on. And again, the next day it was gone. So we put it on her face. Sure enough, the next day, the next day, dramatic improvement. Hmm. in her skin that's why yeah. it's now become the so i when i get out of the shower i use that when i get here to the studio i use my caldera so oh, that's yeah. how i do and because i don't remember if it was you or who i was talking to two different things totally. yeah so yeah. because one of them's got a peptide one of them's like a no no yeah and, and terra skin care is like literally a peptide that's telling your skin regenerate yeah. telling your skin reduce inflammation the healing heal. agents in there yeah yeah uh, other so they products, actually complement each other they're not working against oh each yeah other. oh use them together yeah and watch what happens yeah i mean that's like the, that's what i've told so yeah. people have asked me right obviously i've talked a lot about caldera and then i've now we've talked about Intera now and they're like oh which one should i do it's like well i use yeah. i use both yeah so i think they, they but yeah so if you have any inflamed areas any you know I mean, that's all that psoriasis look, that's that looks like there's damage yeah. or put on healthy skin and watch what happens and it's it's it works so fast that you could tell within a day or two uh, of using it so well this is kind of a sidebar to that but um my uh, brother-in-law and their family they all use like astaxanthin uh, yeah. have you heard about that yeah, yeah, like yeah. Yeah, instead of using any kind of sunblock anymore yeah, yeah. like they kind of i guess they you have to like introduce it a couple weeks ahead of time before you go get like a lot of sun exposure but like i mean they've been able to get a bit darker skin and, and be able to you know really be more resilient in the sun and they're light skin complected yeah. like me yeah so i haven't tried it yet i've just heard about it's it it's improving your your skin's ability to withstand the damage of, of you of the uv, of the UV damage. and that also includes a diet that's high in um essential fatty acids mm. can help with that some people will comment when they're on a keto diet because it's so high in fats that they're like my skin just darkens real nice i don't get a sunburn or whatever it's all about avoiding damage not the tan the tan is fine it's like it's like building muscle with exercise yeah, versus you don't want to go too far. Right. Sunburn is damaged. So you want to avoid uh sunburn. So you want to you want to boost all your body's ability to handle any damage. So using GHKU before you go out in the sun would even be a good idea. Really? You know? Yes. Hmm. Would even be a good idea. But sunscreen is like, you know, you're gonna need that if if it's you're just gonna be exposed to more than your Yeah, it's kind of a color. necessary evil. It's one of those things. I'd you know, I'd love to find a brand that wasn't like so heavily uh had a lot of these like chemical compounds yeah. in it but you know i have to do what i gotta do you, I, i've talked to you about this before you know you'll get a sunburn faster if you wear sunglasses on i your heard skin. that uh, yeah. what that. yeah oh because your eyes perceive it and so it signals to the body brain, how bad it is or not yeah signal. your brain oh, that's interesting will produce will will, will seem so enough. obvious but you wouldn't think about that yeah so you wear sunglasses but then and my eye doctor's getting, like you're gonna get uv uh damage in your eyes though if you're not wearing sunglasses i you can't mean, win i guess so i was like win. cool i think it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. conflicting you information <laughs> yeah dude so anyway yeah. um so shout out what do we got? Um, what do I got for you? Did I shout out on the show? I know I think I might have talked about it briefly, but uh, it's now like, I want to say episode five or six on Presumed Innocent. Have you guys watched no. that yet? 
I've been I, meaning to watch that as an probably Apple, one right? of the best shows on I TV it's right awesome. now. Yeah, I would I would put it up there. What do you think, Doug? I know you're. Yeah, watching. I really like it. I mean, there was a moment there that I felt like they were really broadcasting, you know, things that trying to you know set the narrative for you to think about what yeah. might happen. Yeah, I felt like it was a little bit clunky at at points, but yeah. overall, I love the love the show. Yeah, I think I. What's it about? It's uh this who what's his name Jake Jake Gyllenhaal Gyllenhaal yes Gyllenhaal. Gyllenhaal. so he's a he's a lawyer and without like spoiler like that he's basically is that going to spoil it if I say wh why he's like he's going through the case no right is that well, how, yeah, I don't know I mean <laughs> yeah. so yeah, is it about it's, trial and stuff? yeah yeah it's a whole it's like a it's a case right oh, okay. and it's and it's definitely got all kinds of twists and turns okay, okay. and they try and, and pin this murder uh potentially on him and what doug is talking about which i we, we had we talked about this off air a little bit i was like i actually like that because they are constantly throwing like sending you in to make you want to believe it's this person they make you want to believe it's that person oh. and i love i love these shows that yeah. i can't it's figure out misdirection one, i don't plot. care how good acting how good a show is if i feel like i can figure it out by episode one or two like oh i know what's happening they're yeah. gonna do this they're gonna say this and then this is gonna happen like i don't care how good it is that kind of ruins it for yeah. me I love something where I'm like I'll watch one episode and then I feel convicted that oh it's this person and then the next episode I'm like oh it's definitely not but it's this person yeah. and because they can be a little over top about that is what Doug's pointing out is like sometimes it's like okay they're being obvious they want you to believe it's this person but I also enjoy that because it's I don't here I am five six episodes deep and I don't know I haven't solved what's going on so and the acting is good the storyline is interesting and unique like so it's good it's uh, Apple TV I think right yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's one of one of the better ones on the show probably since uh what was that one that i thought of? one of the first ones that netflix did really good that uh, guy ritchie did that was like the last oh, one I really, gentlemen yeah. yes the, the gentleman. gentleman like i really liked that one that this was is, great yeah since then i feel like this has probably been the, the best show i've awesome. watched haya makes a multivitamin for children that is not candy it's not filled with a bunch of sugar it's not a gummy thing it's an actual multivitamin with efficacious doses of nutrients that we've identified children need. This is the only multivitamin I give my kids. Go check them out. Get 50% off your first order. Go to HayaHealth.com. That's H-I-Y-A Health.com forward slash uh, Mind Pump. And on that link, you'll get that 50% off. All right, back to the show. First question is from Rosanna B. Ben. Why is it so hard to lose that last five pounds? What to do? Even less calories, more cardio? Okay, so there could be a number of reasons, and mm. some of this depends on how lean you are yeah. already. Yeah. Um, the leaner your body gets, typically the more resistant it is uh, to losing more body fat. Remember, body fat on your body is, is a form of- It's an insurance. Insurance. It's it, it, in case of emergency, we have this stored energy, and your body really doesn't like <clears throat> to get too lean. So if, if you're one of those people that's like, hey, I want to get rid of those last five pounds, and you're a female, and you're- you know, 15 or 16% body fat, or you're a guy and you're eight or 9% body fat. It's like, well, this is when your body really fights really hard and you have to be far more perfect with your approach um, to get the extra whatever amount body fat you want to get off. Um, the other part of this is as you lose weight, as you lose body fat, which happens through a calorie deficit, meaning you burn more calories than you take in or you take in less calories than you, than you burn, your body always tries to adapt to match the new energy intake. So if if I'm burning <clears throat> 2,500 calories worth of energy, but I'm only taking in 2,000, my body's only going to allow that to happen for so long. It's going to try to adapt to meet the new <clears throat> caloric intake because it doesn't want to be. It's like it would be like you managing your bank account. Um, you're you're making you know you know 500 dollars a week. You're spending $600 a week. <clears throat> what you're going to do is you're going to figure out how to spend less money. Otherwise, <clears throat> you'll run out of money and be in a bad situation. So your body does this as well. All right, so the question is what to do. Do I eat even less calories? Uh, I mean, technically, but if your calories are already really low, that doesn't. that's not a good long-term approach. A better approach would be to maybe stop trying to lose body fat, go into a period where you're trying to build muscle, get the metabolism to move in the other direction where you burn more calories and then revisit the fat loss because now you're starting with a higher, uh, faster metabolism. Uh, more cardio typically isn't the answer <clears throat> for most people. It can be, but burning calories just through movement, your body adapts to that very quickly. 
speeding up the metabolism is typically the best approach. Yeah, it, this is hard to answer the answer this like yeah. precisely without because technically those could be the answers, right? <clears throat> Just eat a little less. Right. I mean, if you were a client of mine and you were eating uh, twenty eight hundred calories and we have lost weight <clears throat> at twenty hundred calories and you now hit a plateau and we got five more to go, okay, we'll eat twenty three hundred now. You're at a very healthy, sustainable uh, calorie intake to do that. In my experience, the most common reason for this is we've ran out of runway. And this is why I don't care how much weight you have to lose or how long you've been doing this for. Almost everybody that has a weight loss goal uh, or wants to lose body fat, um, I almost always start on a reverse diet first. Mm -hmm. uh, to, so we have more of that runway so that this person is like at this point in their where we hit this plateau, they are only doing say cardio once or twice a week and they're only and they're are, and they're still eating 2500 2800 calories because then it is a simple fix yeah let's just drop the calories a little bit more or hey let's pick up one or two more days of physical activity or cardio and uh, we should break right through that plateau the reason why this becomes a challenging question or a common question is because people decided they're not in good shape they're unhealthy or there's something going on they decide they're <clears throat> going to start their weight loss journey and they just start from there they go hey i'm going to clean up the diet i'm going to start exercising and they kind of throw everything at it right out the gates. And eventually that, or I mean, originally that does work and you start to see the, the dropping, dropping. And then if you do that same formula again, oh, cut calories, increase activity, cut calories, increase activity. And then what ends up happening is like, oh, I still got like five or 10 more to go, but I'm eating 1500 calories. I'm training seven days a week. I'm already doing cardio every day. It's like, so uh, Adam, do I do more cardio? It's like, yeah. no, that's a terrible strategy at that point because it's not sustainable long-term. So in that point, I would do what Sal is saying, which is I would reverse out and say, hey, let's boost calories. Let's go on a, a bulk. Let's go on building muscle for a while to speed the metabolism up so that we can gain some runway. But that's typically what it is. But the truth is, without knowing all those details or asking those questions, it's hard to say it isn't as simple as just cut a few more yeah, calories. Yeah, we're kind of assuming a lot. And there's not a lot of context to this uh, that we obviously would need. If we if they called in, you know, we'd try and dig a lot more sure. about like what amount of calories they're currently on, what their training looks like. Um, because two, like five more pounds, like, is this just a fixed number that they came in with yeah. that they're just trying to get to a destination right. of pounds while, well, you know, maybe their composition looks great, uh, but they're carrying, you know, more weight on the scale than they'd like. Uh, so anyways, there's a lot to kind of extract from this and, and, uh, you know, assess, but yeah, definitely the, the approach we always talk about is like trying your best to, to gain muscle and make sure you're in a really healthy place calorically uh, in order to make it uh, more sustainable at the end. Next question is from Fulvio Castle. Should I program scheduled deloads or just go by necessity? No. There's two kinds of people. <laughs> well, well, there's two kinds of people when it comes to deloads. The first kind are inconsistent with their workouts, in which case your inconsistency is giving you the natural <laughs> deloads, right? You miss a week here or there. Well, there you go. Then there's the fanatics that don't miss a workout for years <clears throat> that tend to do more than they need. Those people benefit from a scheduled deload. I'm one of those people. If I don't have a scheduled deload, I'll keep going until my body's yelling at me and saying, you need to take some time off, in which case I'll finally listen. But I could have listened weeks ago and avoided this, this, you know, situation that I'm in. So it really depends on, on who you are. If you're super fanatical, like schedule them, it makes a big difference. Deloads really accelerate results for those types of people. But if you miss workouts on your own, like don't schedule more time off. You already got that. I mean, I jumped to know right away because it's rare you meet somebody like you, even mm -hmm. somebody who considers himself a gym rat or, you know, a bit of a fanatic and stuff like that. Few people can say like, "Oh, I haven't missed uh, a training week in five years," or right. year. like, "There's small, per very, very small percentage of people where that is the case." And so, I don't think it's necessary to schedule a deload week or a week off for most people. But yes, there is uh, the rare case of somebody like yourself who, if I was training, you would say, "Hey, Sal, this might yeah. be a good you week." You got to be borderline week. obsessed. To that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just feel like for most people. Uh, a vacation comes like very few people don't travel for a week in the year. Very few people don't get sick for a week or two of the year. Like, and so life kind of has these natural 
breaks that happen. And I think following it organically makes the most sense just for consistency reasons, right? Like if I have a client who's got great momentum and they're being consistent and maybe, maybe they would even benefit a little bit from a, a off week or deload week. But I also know that, man, getting them consistent was like such yeah. a huge challenge. Like it might be risky for me to give them, even though I know they might benefit from that week off, I might go, oh man, but this person is, man, they've struggled their whole life with consistency. And this is the first time they've put four months in a row of not missing a day of training. I don't know if I want to do that. That's a total different conversation when I have a Sal that I'm coaching, which was rare, where I'm like, oh, you know what? Like we need to take a week off. Like you are, you never miss. You're always on. Like that's, you know, the other thing too is uh, it, you can, there are specific types of strength training programs that schedule deloads because it's a part of the programming. Uh, for example, MAPS Anabolic Advanced, there's deload weeks scheduled in. Um, many powerlifting style programs will schedule deloads in. That's another approach. Another approach is to schedule the deload as part of the programming because the programming Typically, like MAPS Anabolic Advanced does it, it takes you to the edge and then it gives the deload week and it takes you to the edge and it's part of the programming to have the deload weeks. Not necessarily because, you know, you need a break because you're tired or whatever, but rather it was programmed with the deload week in mind. And so it all makes sense together. So you often see this when it is scheduled, it is part of the person's actual program that they've created. And you see this more commonly in strength sport uh, mm -hmm. uh, programming. You don't necessarily see this in bodybuilding style, but like powerlifting and weightlifting, you'll see this. That's, you know, that's a really mm -hmm. good point that I think you, we should highlight that. Like this does, this also like anything else depends, right? On the person I'm talking to. And if I have a, uh, a performance sports specific type of a goal, jumping higher, running faster, yeah. uh, lifting more weight, specifically like because for competition there this becomes a total different answer for me like right as far as deloading because that becomes necessary yeah mm -hmm. for somebody who could easily tip into overtraining and hinder their performance or most, to make them peak right you'll deload right peak, right yeah. most people uh are <clears throat> trying to be in shape trying to be healthy trying to look a certain way and consistency period tends to trump uh, a little bit of overtraining or a little bit of overdoing on the volume because that's just yeah. something that most people struggle with. That doesn't with. benefit if you're trying to go for a high skill uh, in the performance realm. So yeah, you do really need to be, you need to manage your stress even more uh, judiciously and, and really pay attention to that, uh, you know, so that way you can squeeze the ultimate performance out. Next question is from Healthy and Fitness. Could long hours of sitting at work affect my hamstring strength and be a cause of lower back pain during lifting? Yes. Yes. Yeah, very, 100%. very simple. Easy and yes. common. <laughs> you know, it's funny. So just to break it down for people, right? So you, you get the hamstrings on the back of the leg here, and they are shortened when you bend your knee. They're lengthened when you straighten your knee. So if I straighten my leg out, that makes the muscle lengthen. And if I bend my knee, it's shortened. So I'm going to use a different body part. Because we're so used to sitting that I think right. if imagine, I use, imagine this, yeah. So imagine <laughs> if your arm was in a bent position for twelve hours a day. How would you think it would feel for you to get out of that position and then stretch yeah. your arm out? Your it would feel tight because what happens is, whatever position you're in for a long period of time, your central nervous system, which controls your muscles, the central nervous system tells muscles to tighten or to to loosen or to lengthen or shorten or whatever. It tries to create stability and functionality. Okay. So if I'm sitting with my knees bent all the time, what my CNS, my central nervous system understands about the hamstrings is they're shortened right now. Let's create some strength and stability in this position. Meaning because you're sitting more than you're standing, your, your stability is better or your central nervous system reads that as needing more stability than standing. So then you stand up, you extend your leg hamstrings are lengthening and your CNS is like, what's going on? Normally we're sitting down all day long. Now, why does this contribute to low back pain? The hamstrings anchor at the pelvis. So think of your pelvis bone, right? If they're pulling down on the pelvis, they're shifting the pelvis down in some interesting uh, positions. Meaning also you're going to place some stress on the low back because it connects to the top of the pelvis. So now you've got these opposing forces trying to stabilize your low back. Now you're standing, your, your, your hamstrings are tight because you're always sitting. So now the pelvis is going to be in this unstable situation when you're standing. Then you go and work out and your hamstrings are not working in an optimal way for the exercise and boom, 
you get low back pain. This is also why if you've been listening to the the show for long enough, you've heard me talk about how getting to a place <clears throat> where I can do deep, full range of motion squats eliminated my low back pain. It's not like because there was something magical that squats it other than taking the hamstrings, the hips, everything through its fullest range of motion and strengthening them through that full range of motion then took away that shortening, tightening feeling that yeah. you get from just sitting all the time and not going beyond 90 degrees. And so absolutely, if you have low back pain and you sit a lot and you don't have any sort of mobility practice to address both hamstring and hip mobility, mm -hmm. uh, then it's more than likely is definitely contributing you know, funny. to low back pain. <clears throat> this was, and this is trainers listening right now, you, this little trick. Um, one of the most valuable things or effective things you do when you train, when you get a, a, a brand new client, like a, a goal assessment, they didn't even hire you yet. You're just giving them a goal. You're doing a goal assessment and you're taking them through and you're obviously during a goal assessment as a trainer, you're trying to get the person to see your value so they can hire you. And that what the client is doing, potential client, is they're seeing, should I hire this trainer? So that's that session, right? And one of the most effective ways to show your value to somebody in one session is not build muscle or burn body fat, because you can't. It's only one session. Alleviate pain. I can yep. make pain relief happen. Yes. I, I can do I can make it happen pretty quickly, 80 to 90% of the time when it comes to chronic pain. And so one of my tricks. If somebody had, oh, my low back is always tight. I'd lay them on the ground. I'd do some some passive hamstring stretch. I'd have them stand up, and they'd be like, "Whoa, my low I back know. feels a lot yeah. better." So all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, this this amazing person that understands uh, everything about yeah. the human body is at least what they think. And then they would hire me. But all I did was lengthen their hamstrings, get their their CNS lengthen to chill their out, hamstring, uh, brace their core, get that strong again, that response. Yeah. Uh, Fifteen minutes later, it's low so back passive. Pain is Think gone. about like sitting your, in your chair yeah. right now. You're relaxed and and you're just not supporting everything. And then when you're vertical too, besides having the shortened kind of pull and yeah. that uh, going against you too, you're not bracing properly to you know uh, adjust for the, for those forces coming at you. Next question is from C Batar twenty four. What are trends in the fitness market that you see and would recommend someone to invest into to create passive income? You know why I picked this question, uh, and Adam, I'd love for you to go first because this is your this is where you're a wizard. But when when somebody asks me what do I invest in, in the fitness industry, my initial you know like knee jerk reaction is to say find a different market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know that's what I was actually. It's not the best too. market well, to not, invest in. Right? I'm not There's going, a lot of trends for sure. I'm not going to be far off from that. My my so the initial thoughts I have when someone asks this a uh, couple things one. Uh, it, it seems to be that we get uh, a lot of young trainers that hear this. We talk a little bit about investing and stuff like that. And so they're like, oh, I have X amount of dollars. Uh, where should I invest it? And then because we're in the fitness space, they think we have this like, you know, knowledge on like these great places to put money in, in the fitness space. The truth is, I think when you are at a, a place income wise, where say the number is, you know, less than $100,000 that you have to invest, the best place that you can invest it is in yourself. Uh, invest in yourself in uh, you know educating yourself, growing your skill sets, improving your current ones, learning new skill sets. That money that'll pay uh, you back way more. That'll pay you back what way more. What a great more. point. Yeah. And so you know, and if and, and that when, now when you start talking hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars, millions of dollars, you're uh, you've already uh, achieved mastery in your space, whatever space it is that you're in. Uh, okay, we can have different conversations about you know, high level investing and, and angel investing and, and stocks and things like that. Okay. But for now, for most of the people that ask me this question, the answer is use that money to invest in, in growing your skill sets, improving your current skill sets, becoming a master at whatever your craft is, that's going to pay you back and make you more money than anything else is going to. What a great, yep. what a great yep. point. Cause using the same example, uh, if you took somebody who didn't work out at all, ate a typical standard American diet, right? Heavily in processed foods. And they said, I have $10,000 to invest. Where should I put this money? Well, imagine if they took that $10,000, $5,000 even. Invest in a trainer. And they hired a good trainer. Right. They hired a good coach. Educated them on the Now side. the person is fit and healthy. How much more... How, how much more money could they potentially earn now? Because now they're a healthier fit version of themselves. Think about that. Or even forget the money they could earn. They're just lifestyle, the quality of their life. You take somebody who's, who's average health, which is not good, and you dramatically improve their health, 
they are going to be far more effective at everything that they do. It doesn't matter what business they're in. I don't care what you do. You have more energy. You're more creative. You're more inspired. Um, you could be more effective. And even besides that, even if you don't care about making more money, you're just life is much better. Your relationships are better. You, you, you're more positive. You've got more energy to enjoy things. So yeah, I can see what you're saying. And, and even that simple example, like hire a good trainer or coach, make you fit and healthy. Watch how everything else improves. Yeah. I get where these questions come from. I mean, I probably would have asked this in my early twenties the same way too. Um, but really that's like, it's just gambling. You know, like even if I gave you good advice, I'm like, oh, this company I think is going to blow up and you did go risk whatever savings you had on it and I was right. I still don't think I'm right. I still don't think that's the right answer just because I was right on, I guessed right on the company that's going to blow up. I'll tell you right now too, what's not, all those companies that we talked about four or five years ago when everybody Ooh, thought- the fitness tech companies. Everybody thought we were crazy when we told everybody that the, you know, the the Pelotons and the Tonals and these companies that everybody's like, oh my God. No, they just got evaluated at yeah, a billion. That, those, like, things no. are, those things are those sinking like a rock right now. Yep. And so, yeah, I would be, I would be very cautious of putting my money in, in things like that. And you know what be, it is, is that like, like you think of tech, right? Tech often has revolutionary advances in technology or product that change everything. They completely change everything. Uh, you're not going to find that uh, in fitness. That's right. Uh, be, uh, because no. we already have the equipment, like you don't need equipment. We understand, right? we already understand human biology yeah. well enough. Yeah. The only thing that would be revolutionary would be like things if, that change if, if you could somehow, yes, change human biology. Yeah. Or yeah. behavior, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. Otherwise forget it. Yeah. No. And the fact yeah. that we, that's why, and even the behavior one, I would I would argue a little bit, right? It's like the only thing that's going to break through like a tech thing that goes, you know, bananas and, and 50 X's or hundred X's for somebody is something that in the supplement or something gained that literally changes human biology, which we really haven't seen anything like that because the rules of weight loss, building muscle, that that's, we've known that for a really long time. And it's, and even though we have all these things that enhance it or make it better, none of it moves the needle that like, like tech can, like, a, like yeah. the internet coming out, like completely revolutionize how See, you do business and markets. There's nothing in the fitness space that is going to like completely change I, I how something. you do it. I got something. I, I'm, I'm surprised to think of this. I'll tell you what, if you, and I don't know what this looks like, but if you look at the impact that the GLP-1 peptides are having on weight loss, um, and you're in the fitness industry, you need to figure out how to work with them, how to uh, coach people who work with them, and how to use them with pe for people who otherwise just can't figure this out, even with the best coaching. That, that opportunity is massive. There's also opportunity for abuse and whatever, but I think if you look at GLP-1s, what they can do, how to work with them, I think that there's a huge, because we're looking at culture shifting. I think that reflects any trend though. I'm sorry. I think that reflects any trend because yeah. what we're doing is is providing them with sound training and sound nutrition. You're right. Uh, benchmarks and foundations <laughs> uh, because people need to remember that they have to stick with these things even when there's a revolutionary product or there's some kind of new modality or system that they're applying. Um, you know, the same rules are always going to apply, and it's it, we have to like you know, gauge uh, success based off upon like how this, how my behavior is improving and my growth potential is improving. Listen, I, uh, in the last year, um, I think this is the most, yeah, this, uh, in the last year, uh, Weight Watchers for the GLP one argument you're making right now is the stock that I've bought the most in the last year. Uh, I would still not give that advice. I still would not, as much as I'm betting and gambling on that, and I think that you're right, GLP-1s is going to disrupt the space. And I think Weight Watchers was already like a, you know, established, successful company for 60 plus years that who better than to introduce, to, that is designed around helping people lose weight, who better than to probably, you know, skyrocket because of this. But I would never tell somebody that's got 10 to a hundred thousand dollars, like this is what you should do because I got, I have my pulse on the fitness space. I would still say the exact same advice, even knowing that about GLPs, that's a hundred percent a gamble for me. Yeah. It can completely go belly up and it could be a different company that figures that out. And so, yeah, this is just not, I mean, I'm just not a fan of 
looking at products or things in the fitness space. And I mean, we love to talk about it, right? Yeah. We have fun talking about those things. And I mean, we I'm interested in that bungee cord class with all those ladies. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That one I shared. <laughs> we like to have some fun. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I just. That could take off. I mean, it's such gambling. It's so, it's such gambling. The shake and, 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 and you know, here's the thing yeah. too, man, fitness is really finicky because it does rely on human behavior. And, and I mean, this is how we, it's, still, it's a shiny object. This is how, too, when yeah. Tonal was getting totally. a, what, $4 billion valuation, why we were the only people that were saying like, nah, it ain't yeah. happening. Because why? Because we understand human behavior. Adherence. And it's like, I don't care how cool the machine is. No. You know what I'm saying? I don't care if it does 80% of the load for Unless them. Unless you can change their personality that's and right. character. <laughs> that's right. And so, <laughs> uh, and we understand that because we've been doing this for a long time. So yeah, no, I'm not a... I'm not a fan of like taking shots in the dark on like, you know, giving people advice on what to do um, investing yeah. wise in the fitness space, regardless if we do it and I talk about it and share it, like, I don't think it's good advice. Right. Go invest in yourself. Well, look, check this out. If you like mind pump, if you're a coach or a trainer, we have guides for coaches and trainers. They're totally free. You can find them at mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at mind pump. Justin, I'm at mind pump to Stefano and Adam is at mind pump Adam. 